Good morning, folks. Good morning. Uh, it's great to have you here. Welcome on the fourth Sunday in Lent. My name is Reverend Larry Brickner Wood. I'm the interim minister here at Wakefield. Welcome to anyone on Zoom or Facebook. It's great to have you here in whatever way you found yourself here. Uh, and if you're visiting or here for the first time, we'll say, even though it's Lent, we can say, hallelujah. Uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, everyone is welcome in this open and affirming community. So we're going to start off our announcements with Anne's going to come talk about one great hour of sharing. Good morning. So today we are doing our one great hour of sharing. You've got these envelopes in your bulletins. Um, so it's a great time to share. Uh, we're going to give to communities that are in desperate need, that deal with hurricanes, earthquakes, other national disasters. There was just another earthquake in Peru yesterday, I believe. So um, we also, the money goes to families and refugee camps that are fleeing violence, it goes to people locally and globally without adequate access to clean water or proper sanitation. Um, and as Connie brought it to real time for us a couple of weeks ago, she talked about all the blessings that we have and take for granted, like running water, bathroom, shoes, roof over our head. So um, it also goes towards um, sustainable development, see to feed agriculture, in irrigation projects and much more. So appreciate your generosity today. Um, give generously. Okay, what is it? Uh, a paper towel. Oh, somebody said a rain stick. <laughs> it, it's going to be a rain stick when it's done. And you know what? You can't recycle these in, in Wakefield. These don't get recycled but they're going to be recycled in a musical way and kids will enjoy them when they're done. So what I'm asking of you, if you would please bring in your empty paper towel rolls, you'll see a basket in the back. They've already been started. Also, we can make shakers out of the toilet paper rolls. So there you go. We're going to be recycling and all over or reusing actually reusing. So if you would bring in paper towel rolls and, um, toilet paper rolls and I'll bring in the examples again so you can see sort of what we're making out of them but I thank you for your help. Joe? Yes? Just incidentally the, the uh, roll inside of uh, a package of wax paper or tin foil same size. Oh <gasps> wax paper or tin foil has and I think they're thicker rolls than these are which which would be nicer these are pretty flimsy so, but we can still use them but yes Wax paper, tin foil, I'm pretty sure we all use that. So if you could bring those rolls in, put them right in the basket in the back, we would greatly appreciate it. We're getting ready already for music camp. That's not until the end of July, but we have to think ahead. So thank you very much. Celia. Yeah, um, I think great. I have talked about older kids. Yeah. 
Sure. Like a giant, a giant rain stick. We love it. No, you can't have them. No, no. I have boom. No. But anyway, thank you, Celia. They're mine. Sorry. We tend to be like that. My territory, sorry. Arts and crafts. Arts and crafts, separate from music, thank you. All right, so I thank you so much. I know we really love each other, but sometimes. So thank you, and I appreciate it, and I am starting the collection. Connie, you're, you're next. Okay, let's end this conflict by the pancake breakfast. Yeah. Two weeks, two weeks, April 1st, and all the proceeds are going to help us fund the sh humanitarian shipping container to Zimbabwe. So I hope that you're able to participate next, uh, April 1st, Saturday, April 1st, from 8 until 10.30ish. Thanks. Anyone else? <laughs> That's quite the discussion, you know. For, for folks watching this online, you know, that's, that's kind of par for the course, you know. Anything can become a theological discussion, uh, even cardboard rolls. So may we prepare to center ourselves as we come together as a community. The call to worship this morning is a little bit different. There's going to be some singing in there, which is awesome, especially for a beautiful day like today. Um, you're going to be singing on page 633, God Restores My Soul and Leads Me in Right Paths. And Cindy's going to play it because I don't know it either. So go, Cindy. 633. Oh, sure. Sorry. One more time, Cindy. Okay. So why don't we try this together? What's going to happen is you're going to sing that. I'm going to read. And at the end of the reading, you're going to sing it again. You'll know it even better by then. So let's all try this together. Go ahead, Cindy. God restores my soul and leads me in right paths. God is my shepherd. I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. God restores my soul and leads me in right paths for the sake of God, of God's name. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of God my whole life long. And again we sing. God restores my soul and leads me in right paths. And now please join me for the invocation, which is based on Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Long ago, God said to Samuel, it is time to move into a new day 
and a new leader, a new shepherd was anointed and called David. From the humblest of places, a new era rises. Rise up, Lord. Help us to rise and shine and accept your call into our hearts, into our hands, and into our heads. May we see with the eyes of your wisdom. Amen. And please stand and join me for the hymn, which is Every Time I Feel the Spirit. What a wonderful hymn for today. To, I'd like to invite, I was going to invite children and children of all ages, and one came down. Um, so you're welcome to come up here in the front, get a front row seat. Is he a shaker? Oh, he's got We're handing out these shaker eggs again because we're going to do something a little different with them. Would you like this one with the handle? You can keep that one too. I've got a green one in honor of St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. So. You know, when I, so we're singing this month some of the gospel spirituals that are in the New Century Hymnal. The Faith Formation Group is really looking at spirituals and hymnals as a part of their Lenten series. And so they identified all the spirituals in the New Century Hymnal uh, and also talked about some others. And I thought it'd be great to sing them. They're inherently singable. And I grew up, growing up in Virginia, I grew up with these songs. We sang them in public school. Uh, I don't know why, we just did, you know, and uh, we didn't even attach a religious meaning to them. I think partially we sang them because they got you moving. Now, I grew up and there were some traditions, so I grew up in Virginia where there was a church on every block, uh, at least one, sometimes more than one. Um, and there was a Baptist church on every block, so there was usually two churches. And some of my friends who went to Baptist churches began to tell me that, oh, they, they didn't sing or move in their church. And I know that there are those traditions who believe that dancing is a bad thing, that movement is a bad thing, partially because they think it's a doorway to the demons, to the evil spirits. Now, I, I, that's perplexed me for years. Now, I grew up in a tradition where we did sing, we just didn't sing well at all. Um, and we had kind of unsingable songs. Now, that's changed. Now some of the Irish Roman Catholic music is quite good, but um, we didn't sing much either, but we, we didn't move much either because you couldn't turn around and that was a sin and such. But I've always been curious about why the notion of movement is seen as bad. Now it's, it's easy to poke fun at other people, but we're descended from the Puritans. They didn't move much at all either. And in fact, part of that descendancy, Martin Luther included, believed that our sanctuary should be just bare. 
There should be no color, no artwork, because they were afraid of icons. Thankfully, we've, we've kind of moved from that, and now we have beautiful artwork in our sanctuaries, but we also can move. So, you know, some people joke that in New England, we're, we're called God's frozen people. Yeah. And you know why that is? Not because we live in the north. Anyone have a sense of why that is? We don't move. We don't move. Now, it's hard to move. If, you, if you're, part of your muscle memory is we don't move in church. But if you've been in any gospel churches, you talk about movement done in such a sacred way. People are moving. Once at the community church of Durham, when we first moved to Durham, they had a gospel choir from Harlem come up, and their kids were moving. The babies were moving. And it inspired even some of the frozen people to move. A little hard to watch the frozen people move, but we can move. So what I'd like to do is have us move. Now that move can be a little, can be a clapping of the hands. We're going to sing a song, Now we're singing a little bit later, a little different version. We're going to sing a song that I definitely grew up with. We sang this in school all the time. Uh, this is called The Little Baby, but it's really the song, Amen. Amen. You can say amen too. Um, anyone not know this song? Amen. 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 Okay, you know this song, so you're going to sing the amen part, and that's pretty easy. So in the, the words are up here on the screen, and then um, Joe might help us sing. The, the, Joe and I, will, the three of us will sing the choruses, and then you sing the amen parts, wherever it says amen. So after each line, there's a break, and it says amen. So um, the chorus is amen, 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 and then we're going to sing it over now. So we're going to all do the chorus, and then we'll go into the verses, and you'll sing amen. And you, if you wanted some eggs, we've got some shaker eggs up here, but also if you wanted to move, if anybody wants to stand up and dance, it doesn't matter how well you dance. God's calling us to move because if we're going to bring justice in the world, we've got to move to do it. You can't bring justice sitting in your seat. You can't bring light into the darkness if you can't move. All right. Are you ready? Are you ready to move? You went. Did you go skiing this weekend? Okay. Where'd you go skiing? Abenaki. Abenaki. Okay. So we know you can move, right? You can move really well. All right. We're ready. Are you ready to move? I like to move it. Move it. I like to move it. Okay. So the first, the first eight minutes, five times. Okay. You ready to try this? Yeah. Let's do it. You ready to move? It could even be a subtle movement. Just a subtle movement. It could be a tap on the feet. Walk in and stand up. Get us ready. It's good for your soul. Okay. Here we go. Amen. Amen. The little baby, yeah. Yeah. Oh, lying in the manger <laughs> on Christmas morning. Amen, amen. See him in the manger. <laughs> Talk with the elders. Amen. And how they marveled. Amen, amen, amen. Verse three. See him at the seashore. Amen. And healing all the sick ones, amen. Preaching to the people, amen. And healing all the sick ones, amen, amen, amen. There's the chorus, amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. You, you were right. Y'all didn't do it very well, did you? <laughs> Someone's singing the complete wrong verse up here. Yeah, yeah. me. I didn't even realize it was I didn't more. Know. Yes. It's holy chaos. Right? You know, sometimes when you're skiing, no matter how good you are, occasionally you'll lose a little bit of control. But what do you do? You do the things you know, right? And sometimes occasionally you fall, but sometimes it just brings you back and you're ready. You're ready to go. 
Thank you all for moving. <laughs> moving for Jesus. Moving for Jesus. I love it. The scripture this morning is <clears throat> John all through 41, and it's from the Open English Bible, and this is kind of fun. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who had been blind from his birth. Rabbi asked his disciples, who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither the man nor his parents, replied Jesus, but he was born blind so that the work of God should be made plain in him. We must do the work of him who sent me while it is day, because night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Saying this, Jesus spat on the ground, made some paste with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said, and wash your eyes in the bath of Siloam, a word which means messenger. So the man went and washed his eyes and returned able to see. His neighbors and those who had formerly known him by sight as a beggar exclaimed, is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Yes, some, some said, it is. While others said, no, but it's like him. And then the man himself said, I am he. How did you get your sight then, they asked. The man whom they called Jesus, he answered, made a paste and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash your eyes. So I went, washed my eyes and gained my sight. Where is he, they asked. I do not know, he answered. They took the man who had been blind to the Pharisees. Now, it was Sabbath when Jesus made the paste and gave him his sight. So the Pharisees also questioned the man as to how he gained his sight. He put a paste on my eyes, he answered, and I washed them, and I can see. The man cannot be from God, said some of the Pharisees, for he does not keep the Sabbath. How is it possible, retorted others, for a bad man to give signs like this? So there was a difference of opinion among them. And they again questioned the man, what do you yourself say about him? For it is to you that he has given sight. The religious authorities, however, refused to believe that he had been blind and had gained his sight until they called his parents and questioned them. Is this your son, they asked, who you say was born blind? If so, how is it that he can see? We know that that is our son, answered the parents, and that he was born blind. But how is it that he can now see? We do not know, nor do we know who it was that gave him his sight back. Ask him. He's old enough. He will tell you about it himself. His parents spoke in this way because they were afraid of the authorities. For the authorities had already agreed that if anyone should acknowledge Jesus as Christ, he would be expelled from the synagogues. This was why his parents said, he's old enough, ask him. So the authorities again called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this is a bad man. I know nothing about him being a bad man, he replied. One thing I do know, that although I was blind, now I can see. What did he do for you, they asked. How did, you give, how did he give you your sight? I just told you, he answered, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Surely you also do not want to become disciples. You are a disciple. You are his disciple, they retorted scornfully. But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Well, the man said, this is very strange. 
You do not know where he comes from, and yet he has given me my sight. We know that God never listens to bad people, but when a person is God-fearing and does God's will, God listens to them. Since the world began, such a thing was never heard of as anyone giving sight to a person born blind. If this man has not been from God, he could not have done anything at all. You, they retorted, were born totally depraved, and you are trying to teach us? So they expelled him. Jesus heard of their having put him out, and when he found the man, he asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Tell me who he is, sir, he replied, so that I may believe in him. Not only have you seen him, said Jesus, but it is he who is now speaking to you. Then, sir, I do believe, said the man, bowing to the ground before him. And Jesus added, it was to put people to the test that I came into the world, in order that those that cannot see should see, and those that can see should become blind. Hearing this, some of the Pharisees who were with him said, then, are we blind too? If you had been blind, replied Jesus, you would have had no sin to answer for. But as it is, you say, we can see, and so your sin remains. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Morgan. Thanks for reading that. That's a really long scripture. Now, last week was long. Next week is even longer. <laughs> but you can't, you can't, it's like cutting the story in the middle, right? Sometimes we do that with scripture, but uh, what goes on before and after and throughout is a part of the story. And the Open English Bible, I'll talk a little bit about why I chose that, but I use different translations, uh, and that's a Bible accessible to all. Uh, it's free. Um, during the pandemic, some of the Bible publishers were pinging people for copyright infringements. The Open English Bible is a Bible available to anyone um, online and elsewhere. So um, that's one reason I like it. It's used in a little more contemporary language as well. Let us pray a sec. Gracious and loving and laughing God, may you bring us into this community of faith as we sing and move and pray and be quiet and take it in. May the words of our mouths and the meditations and all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen, amen, amen. So, I love the Gospel of John, despite some of my real criticisms of it. And as we go through in Lent, I always preached on Psalm 23 because it's a lovely, lovely psalm, but we sang it together. And the psalms were sung in days gone by. They were meant to be sung, not necessarily just read and heard. But this passage from John kind of begged in these days and times to be talked about. There's a wonderful singer-songwriter named David Wilcox who has a beautiful song written, he wrote in the 80s called Fearless Love. He usually does it after a little story he tells called The Carpenter Story. You might guess who that's about. Um, and then he leads into Fearless Love, and it's a song for many of you all who may remember, set in the 80s in the midst of the AIDS crisis. And many of you all may remember as AIDS emerged as an epidemic and a pandemic, many people, including many in the Christian tradition, said it was God bringing it on those folks who got it. And so David Wilcox's song is about a demonstration that his church went to in the park. There were folks who were advocating for more humane and enlightened policies towards those who had HIV and AIDS. And there were his church and others there saying, this is the wrath of God. So David Wilcox writes this song about a man who was there because his church was there, who had to face what happens when his beliefs come alive right in front of him. Uh, and by the end of the song, he is lifting up one of the men, men of the men, one of the people who were there 
to advocate for better AIDS policies because he had been hit by a stone by someone from his church who had yelled at the time the wrath of God. Now, for years, some of y'all may know, for years I was a municipal official. I worked for local government. Uh, it was something I loved dearly. But also, as I think back, it was kind of an odd place for someone who was raised in the 60s who has, to this day, struggles with authority. Um, I, some of you all may be surprised. Most people aren't. But I do struggle with authority, and I have to catch myself. It's taking, well, I'm still not there yet. It'll take till I take the bus out of here to really grapple with that. But I found myself in positions of authority in trying to deal with how my beliefs came alive on me again and again, and trying to deal with the application of rules and policies in the context of real human beings and real beings on the planet affected by them. And one of the things it did for me, and the good thing, was that I constantly asked, why do we have this rule? Sometimes the answer was, because we always have. You know, every group says that, right? And sometimes it led to saying, well, I think it's time to maybe think about changing it, which is always good to look periodically at what you do and why you do it. Because we are meant to evolve. People who believe in the Holy Spirit believe in the evolving spirit that takes us to different places. And we can't go to different places if we're stuck where we're standing. Now, there were many times when I said, because we've always done it. And... I still think about those times when I could have done something differently, more humane, better, more compassionately, more wise. But I was caught in the context of authority and power. Now I want to talk about this passage of John because it, to me it speaks to the arrogance of power. But before I do that, I just want to say two things and then talk a little bit about the Pharisees. One, the re one of the reasons I picked the Open English Bible translation is because it doesn't use the word the Jews, which is used in most of our translations. And there's no question that the Gospel of John has been used for anti-Semitic reasons throughout Christian history. Um, not just a period, throughout, including to this day. And the people who have done that through the centuries have taken John's Gospel a lot out of context. Because John, when he says the Jews, the people who wrote the Gospel of John, by and large, were Jews. So when he said the Jews, what he really meant, but he couldn't necessarily get away with it, he meant the leaders, the authorities. In the context of the time, John also was trying to differentiate. It's the last of the Gospels written, so he was trying to move into what became clearer and clearer was something that wasn't going to remain a part of Judaism. But it isn't an attack on the Jewish people or the Jewish culture though it has been used that way by people in power to do horrible things. And we know what some of those horrible things are and what are still being done to this day. Also, we struggle sometimes in scripture about how folks with certain different kinds of abilities are portrayed. And so this story of a blind man is cast in the times, people who had non-typical abilities were seen as either they had sinned or their parents had sinned or they were deficient they were depraved as it says in this gospel and we know more and more that is not the case so when we read these we're not trying to perpetuate that because that's what people believed at the times but part of what we do with scripture is move through it in an evolving way we move like the holy spirit and see these traditions in a different light so that brings me to the Pharisees, which we hear about all the time, and which I just thought were bad people. The Pharisees were a particular part, there were probably 6,000 of them at the time this was written. They were a group that were one of the different groups of Jewish tradition, and they were folks who tended to be middle class and lower class. The Sadducees, as we hear about sometimes, were the elite upper class folks. So the Pharisees were folks who were trying to carve their way in an emerging Judaism. They were more fluid than, say, the Sadducees, who were very much purist and very much believed in the rigidity of the law. So the Pharisees emerged 
and were part of the group that were interacting with Jesus repeatedly. Now, some of the Pharisees were followers of Jesus and no doubt had an influence on the Christianity that emerged. Others became a part of that group that said, crucify him, and were part of the reason he was executed. But the Pharisees by themselves are not bad. They became, after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 CE, they became the foundation for rabbinical Judaism. And so much of Reform Judaism, in particular Conservative Judaism too, is informed by the Pharisees and the Pharisaic tradition. The Pharisees tended to believe, they had five key beliefs, they probably believed others too, but one is that God controls all things, but our individual actions determine sometimes how God's will is imposed in this world. We have a role. We're not just passive bystanders. God, they believed in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in an afterlife, which was a juxtaposition to many Jewish traditions at the time. They believed in a Messiah that was to come. A lot of them didn't necessarily believe that Jesus was that, but they believed in a Messiah. They also believed that scripture was critical, but that the oral tradition was as important as the written scriptures that they had. That definitely set them apart from groups like the Sadducees. Now, even within the Pharisees' tradition, some of you may have heard of the Rabbi Hillel. Uh, he was a pretty famous rabbi. Uh, there were two main rabbis at the time, around Jesus' time. One was Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. Rabbi Shammai believed in a much more rigid version of Jewish law and tradition. Rabbi Hillel was a little more fluid and believed that that was constantly evolving with the interplay of how we live in the world and the tradition that we have at the present time. And Rabbi Hillel's version tended to be the one that mingled best with Jesus's teachings. Because Jesus's teachings often said, look at what you're doing and why you're doing it. So that brings us to this passage, the healing. So too often we talk about this passage as a healing, and there's no question that the man who has been born blind is healed. There's a healing that happened, and it's a wonderful healing. Jesus is used, he uses water again, his saliva, but he uses the elements of the earth. He didn't have much, he, the, the blind man says, would you heal me? And he says, well, I got, I got my saliva, I got the mud right here, I've got the air, I've got my hands, and so he makes a paste puts it on the man's eye and says, go bathe in the healing waters, and he does, and he's healed. There is a healing, a reminder that sometimes it doesn't take much to heal other than a belief that you can be healed, whatever it may be in your heart. Jesus also made it clear that the man wasn't blind because anyone had sinned, and right away tried to put to bed a teaching that was so harmful to folks as if we bring on the bad things that happen to us that we still grapple with to this day within our Christian tradition. Then as it goes on, the blind man obviously wants to share with people what happened to him. So he does, and the neighbors first, they didn't really know what to make of it. They're like, huh, we knew him as a blind person, now he's healed, but didn't quite know what to do with it, but they didn't necessarily disbelieve it. But they took him to the Pharisees, the authorities, the leaders. And so the Pharisees blessed them. Some of the Pharisees believed what had happened. They knew that a healing, a sign had occurred. But many of them, probably the majority said, this can't be possible. How could this person, this person, Jesus, have done something good because he's not one of us and rather than have an open heart that accepts healing can come from places we don't expect they said okay we've got to put this man on trial so then he said bring forth his parents because maybe he wasn't blind at all he was just fooling us so they said yep our son was blind but that testimony wasn't enough they said well you know still something something's amiss because it didn't come from us. And so as they questioned the man, one of the ultimate indignities is seeing what had happened, 
he looked at him and says, out of the temple. Out of the temple. Because you've been healed, we want you out. They were quite willing, time after time, to have the man at the gates of the temple blind and begging while they walked by, thinking that was a good gesture. We let poor people stand at the gates. But when he was healed, they threw him out of the temple. You talk about the arrogance of power, of people when they're in power's inability to see change and goodness when it's right in front of them. Doesn't make them bad people, but it does make their actions from that point harmful. So the Pharisees are this example of what can happen when power becomes our ultimate goal. Now, I can sit here and go, I was the Pharisees. I'm glad I'm not one of them. But I stand here in 2023 with Pharisees all around it. I've been a part of them. When power, all of our structures have power systems to them. And so when power is met with the evolution, the revolution of change, it quite often responds with, that can't be. One, it didn't come from us. So how dare you, some of you beggars and poor people and depraved people, how dare, dare you come in front of us and be healed? Because all the good things have to come from us, right? I mean, think of some of your times you've been in power. Think of some of the times when you've been speaking power, including truth to power. And the powers have said, no, we're not believing it. In fact, they attack you. How dare you question us? Now, I was raised believing in democracy, so I'm thinking that's an anti-democratic thing, but power doesn't necessarily care about whatever system it's in. It's power, and it becomes arrogant. Sometimes some of the best people, the Pharisees, who are learned, devoted, faithful people, start to listen to the power instead of listening to the heart. And that's where the scene comes in. Jesus really isn't talking about the sight from the eyes. Jesus is talking about how you see. Mohammed Yunus, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, who was years ago spoke at UNH. The business Paul College brought him here. He was from Bangladesh and created an incredible system that had to do with loans and economic and community development that worked beautifully well in Bangladesh. And as he talked about this packed Grand Estate Room, I kept thinking, oh, that wouldn't work here. Because so much of it was on faith and trust. People weren't even signing papers when they got loans. And so one graduate student from the Paul College says, Mr. Yunus, or Dr. Yunus, how could we do that here? And his answer was so simple. He says, it depends on how you see. And then he made an acknowledgment. He wasn't talking about this. As he talked later, it was about you first see with your heart. You see with your body. You see with the spirit. And some of us may have the ability to see with our eyes. But sometimes those of us that can see with our eyes are blinded by what's informing us. And what's the context by which we see. So Jesus is inviting us to see with more than our eyes. To see with our heart. Because ultimately, as it says throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus is the light in the darkness. In chapter 1, verse 4, Jesus is the light that shines and a light that comes from the beginning and overpowers any shadows. And that light carries through the, out the Gospel of John. Chapter 10, which explains chapter 9, Caroline Lewis has a wonderful commentary on it, says very much that that notion of the good shepherd that Jesus talks about in chapter 10 is about what happens when the light comes in. So many times when we're speaking to power, we're asking them to let the light in, to see with more than their eyes and their minds, to begin to see with their hearts. Now, I'm always the one to be the one speaking truth to power because it makes me feel like I'm one of the good people. But too often, I'm at the table like one of the Pharisees, holding back, saying, that can't be because it didn't come through the right way. John invites us to see and 
think and feel and be different, to let our beliefs, our beliefs come alive on us. So when I was working on this, I found a Bible that we used in confirmation in Lee. And there was a prayer that actually ended this chapter that I remember doing with the confirmation folks. And it goes like this. Lord, can you fix my eyesight as you did for the blind man? I want to see with your eyes those who are mocked for being different at school. I want to see with your eyes the homeless person on a park bench. I want to see with your eyes people from other races and cultures. I want to see beyond people who think being thinner or stronger makes you more lovable. I want to see beyond people who view wealth as the way to life. I would add power too. Help me to see with your eyes, Lord. Blind me to the way the world sees so that I won't give in to judging people on their looks, their color, their race, their gender identity, their orientation, their social status, their religion, or their personality. Help me to see and to love as you love, with eyes so wide open that they see past the outside and right into the hearts of others. May we all see with the light of Jesus. I better know what's coming next. <laughs> We're going to sing. We're going to sing Amen again. A little different version, but you all kind of know. You can move to this hymn. You can stand up, too. She gives you even more, more ability to move. It's number 161. Yes, Joe, you're going to help me with this? So we're going to divide you up here. We're going to throw another curve with you. So this side, what's, Cindy, what should one side do? Okay, so you all are going to do the verses. And you all are going to do the amen. Yes. So you've got the easier role, so it, it means you have to let them go to coffee hour first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we're going to give this a try. <laughs> Amen. Some of the Pharisees were saying, you can't sing Hallelujah in Lent. But Lent is 40 days, but the Sundays are not a part of that 40 days because they would be 46 days. So Sunday was meant to be the time when we break fast, when we celebrate and come together in community, even as we're being reflective. So it's okay to sing and say Hallelujah in Lent, on, at least on Sunday.
It also is because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Okay to say hallelujah when joy strikes you uh, any time of the year. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. We're going to join in prayer together. I invite you to lift up prayers that may be on your hearts. Uh, Joe will bring around the mics to folks. You want one too. Joe and Gail bring around mics. There any any prayers out there you'd like to lift up? I would like prayers for my daughter-in-law, Colleen, who lost her mother last night. Aww. And just uh, prayers for her and family. Thank you, Tisha. Sorry. Oh, Donna's got the other one. Donna? All right. We got a phone call from G3. That's our son, Georgie, um, this morning. And uh, he marched in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City. <laughs> and it was called a sober parade, which was quite wonderful. Um, and he got a, a, we're waiting to see the selfie, but he got a picture with, um, what, what level? Bishop. Bishop Whalen. Bishop Whalen. And I, I don't know if our son's turning Catholic, but it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. He's just, just, just doing so great. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, Praise the Lord. It's right, Connie. Oh, um, Evie Troon. Evie has really had uh, uh, a difficult time this week. She was under um, hospital care, and she's at home now recovering. But she has some, uh, some clots in her lungs that need to dissolve. And um, she's being well cared for, but prayers, prayers, prayers for Evie. Absolutely. I might add in uh, Molly Rose right now. <laughs> Some of you already know about Molly Rose. Um, she had an incident at school and was pushed to the ground. Her head hit, the side of her head hit, uh, felt fine for a while. She has a pretty severe concussion. So um, they were in visiting Ma, uh, Mo's mother in Braintree, and she ended up at Children's Hospital in Boston. Uh, she's not there now. She just, they, she saw a neurologist and all that, so it's just time. So I pray for not only healing, but patience. Patience is a tough one, and it's gonna take a while for her to be back to a normal six-year-old. So hold her, them all in your prayers, please. Anybody else? Oh, sorry, there's a whole bunch on this side. I got a busy side over here, excuse me. I just want to celebrate all the work Martha Jo has been doing in the last couple of years. <laughs> she wasn't here last Sunday. She got up super early and she and the dog hiked Mount Washington last Sunday. Um, and she's been doing a ton of that, but that's something really solid to point to and I'm really proud of her. Thank you. You're a Thank good you. man. Great work. Uh, uh, friends of uh, Jean and I, uh, Sandy and Jim Brown, have a 21-year-old grandson, Sean, who's extremely ill with leukemia. Oh. And uh, we'd like to maybe include him in our prayers oh. today. What's his name? Sean. Sean. Yeah. For Sean. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, online, we have Connie Twombly is sorry to miss the service today, but she's sitting home with bronchitis. Mm, I'm sorry. And Norma, uh, prayers for her aunt Pat's friends and family. She passed away Wednesday morning. Uh, we keep them in our prayers. Thank you, Nate. Oops. Okay. Um, hi. So Sage and her theater troupe at Massabesic won regionals. First time in Yay. over 10 years, and next weekend they're off to states, so. Oh, yeah. All right. Go Mustang. That's great work. Okay. Well, mine doesn't seem like much, but I'm pr flying to Florida next Friday, because we're going to make up the two days we spent in our room because of the hurricane. So, <laughs> so we're going back to collect our two days. <laughs> And, and I'll be visiting my sister the day I land, so, and she was very, very sick a few months ago, so it'll be great. Yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. There are no traveling prayers too mercies. small, and traveling prayers are always yes. warranted, particularly if you're going to Florida. <laughs> 
I, I would request prayers for my daughter and her partner, who are very much in love, but are struggling with the logistics of their relationship. Absolutely. Keep them in our prayers. Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry. Come in. Uh, celebration for um, Julia, who found out this week she was accepted into the St. Paul School Advanced Studies Program for this summer, which is a big deal in New Hampshire. It's kind of follow following in uh, Jillian's um, footsteps from a few years ago. So that's, um, that's really cool. And thank you, Ryan. Um, but it's all buttercup. It's all buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> that's great news. Thank you. That's exciting. I just wanted to share, um, there are some visitors here, and I just wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, and, and two of them were Waysmeet residents and interns. So there's Jen uh, and Cecilia, um, and they're with their partners, Izam and Jeremy. So these are, when you wonder who lives at Waysmeet, here's some of the folks that live there. Bright lights. Any other prayers? I invite you to join in there prayers of the people. This is from one of the women that Sojourners has named as one of the visionaries, Christian visionaries for 2023. Creator God, thank you so much for creating each one of us uniquely and special. Help us to celebrate our diversities and embrace those who are so different from us. Grant us your wisdom to choose and live wisely. Grant us your peace so we can be peacemakers. Grant us your love so we may love our enemies. Gracious God, aid us to live with gratitude. The blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Support us to use our gifts faithfully. Further your kingdom here on earth. Thank you for your grace and love for us. Hear our prayers this day as we say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed is thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Be forgiven our debts. Be forgiven those. Thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory. I got us out of sync there. So, Anne, do you want to say any more about one great hour of sharing before we take the offering? Yeah, so as, as, we, as we take the offering this morning, think about one great hour of sharing. It does tremendous work around the world. Any of our communities could be the ones affected by some disaster. So.
dedication. Blessings abound in our lives. In this season of Lent, may these gifts symbolize our faith. May they be vehicles of our values. May they be the seeds of hope that bring Jesus' revolution of love one step closer in our world. Amen. And we're going to sing Guide My Feet, number 497 in the Black Hymnal. coffee hour uh, down in Fellowship Hall. Uh, you all are welcome. And may you go on this beautiful Sunday with the peace of Christ alive in your heart, with the Holy Spirit helping you move, helping you move through your day with grace, beauty, and love. Peace be with you all. Yeah. <laughs> 